A couple weeks ago, I built a brand new trio of servers to work as a home lab here in my home network rack. And we're finally gonna run them through their paces. Today, I'm gonna install Proxmox and configure them as a cluster for high availability. Let's get started. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Like I said in the intro, today we're gonna to be installing Proxmox into a high availability cluster. But what are the advantages of running your Proxmox server like that? Well, it all starts with central management, sharing of resources, and uptime for all of your virtual machines. For example, if you wanna set up a network share for your Proxmox servers, you can just configure it once for your entire cluster, rather than having to configure that network share for each individual network node. And if you need to shut down a node to work on it, you can just shut it down. And one of the other nodes will automatically fire up the virtual machines from that host. If you haven't watched my home lab starter video, you can click right up here to see in depth what hardware we're working with and get a full build log while you're at it. But long story short, I have three identical servers running Machinist X79 motherboards, a Xeon E5 2648L eight core 16 threaded processor and 32 gigabytes of 1866 megahertz registered ECC memory. For storage, we have a 32GB M.2 SATA SSD to boot from and a pair of 2TB SATA drives to store all of our virtual machines on. I'm going to be setting up a 3-node Proxmox cluster with these servers. Now originally I had only planned on using two of them, but the way Proxmox's high availability works requires three separate nodes to function properly without any weird scripting. Essentially, each server gets to vote on which server gets to be the master in the cluster. A quorum is reached when one server has the most votes, and the reason you need three servers is that a quorum cannot be reached in the event of a tie, and with only two servers, each server will automatically just vote for the other, creating a tie every time. If a quorum can't be reached, then none of the nodes will start up their virtual machines. So the general advice is to use three nodes at a minimum, and keep your servers in odd numbers. Alternatively, you can set up another system with what's called a Q-disk, or quorum disk, which will not host any virtual machines, but it will be able to vote on which server gets to be the master. And with all that out of the way, how do you actually get a Proxmox cluster up and running? First off, you'll need to install Proxmox onto each of your servers you plan to use. For today, I'm using the current release of 6.2-4, but these instructions should work for any configuration above 6.0. During the setup process, it will ask you to name your servers and give each of them an IP address. I named my servers homelab-pve-01 and gave them an IP address of 10.10.0.21 through 23. Once your servers are up and running, we're actually going to get them configured into a cluster straight away. Log into your first server, go to data center, go to the cluster menu, and then click on create cluster. Here, you're gonna set up a name for your cluster. In my case, I named mine craft-homelab and set up which network interface you'll be using for synchronization. If everything looks good, click on Create. The process usually only takes a couple seconds and should give you a Task OK message at the end. Go ahead and close that window if everything looks good, and you should now have a cluster configured with a single node. To get the other two nodes joined to the cluster, click on the Join Information button at the top of the screen. In the pop-up window, copy the Join Information field. This will be pasted into your other servers and get them into the cluster. With that copy, go ahead and log into your second server, go to Data Center, Cluster, and then click on the Join Cluster button. Paste in the join information here and enter the root password of your first server. If everything looks correct, click on Join Cluster. This process again only takes a couple seconds, but your session will stop responding as Proxmox restarts a couple services. If you go back to server one, you should now see that server two has joined and is visible as a node in your cluster. And if everything worked out properly, go ahead and do the exact same process for server three. Next up, we need to configure storage for each of our nodes. Now, each of my servers have identical storage setups with a pair of two terabyte SATA disks each. We're going to be configuring these into a ZFS mirror. And the way we do this is very important to enable high availability in the cluster. The Z pools must have identical names. Otherwise, if a VM is migrated to a new node, it won't know what path it needs to follow to access its virtual disk. When you're ready, go ahead and go to node one, go to disks and make sure your storage drives are showing up and are healthy. Next, we're gonna go to ZFS and click on Create ZFS. Type in the name for your ZFS pool. In my case, I named it HL-Storage. Set the RAID level you'd like to use. In my case, I'm setting up a mirror and select the disks you'd like to add to your ZFS pool. Also, just on this first node, you'll wanna make sure the Add Storage checkbox is checked. We will not be checking that box on the other two nodes. Once you're done, go ahead and click on Create. On the left-hand side of the screen under node one, you should see your storage pool is now available. If everything looks right, go ahead and set up the other two. First off, head up to node two, go to disks, and again, verify that your disks are available and healthy. 
Go to the ZFS menu and click on Create ZFS. Here, you'll want to enter in the exact same name for your ZFS pool, and it is case sensitive, so do pay attention. I'm going to type in HL-Storage again. This time around, however, I'm also going to want to uncheck the Add Storage box. Don't forget to do that, otherwise this process will not work. I'm going to select Mirror for the RAID level and select both disks to add to the pool, and then click on Create. And if everything works out well, go ahead and do the same exact thing for node number three. Once you have all of your ZFS pools created, it's time to actually join them together for high availability. Go to Data Center, click on the Storage menu, and here I can see my HL Storage ZFS pool. Open up that pool and click on the Nodes pull-down menu. I'm going to select nodes 2 and 3, and then click on OK. If done correctly, all three of your nodes should now have ZFS pools named HL-Storage accessible beneath them. Configuring these pools does not immediately set up replication though, as each of these nodes still controls its own storage, and each of them can be unique. To set up replication, you'll need to actually configure each VM to replicate to the other nodes in your cluster. But first off, we need a VM to test with. On node number one, I'm going to set up an Ubuntu 20.04 VM and install Pi-hole. This will give me both a virtual machine and a running service, and we can see if both replication and high availability are functioning inside the cluster. By the way, I am going to be doing an updated tutorial for Pi-hole as a virtual machine, along with some added privacy functionality very soon. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that one. Once the virtual machine has been set up, we need to configure replication for it. Click on the virtual machine itself, go down to Replication, and then click on the Add button to create a replication job. Under Target, I'm going to select Node 2 and leave the schedule at every 15 minutes. You can set up the replication tasks to basically happen as often or infrequently as you'd like. Keep in mind though that replication is a very bandwidth intensive task, and if you're only using a single network card for cluster replication and for service, you might see some availability issues in your virtual machines. Click on Create if everything looks good in your replication menu. Next, I'm going to click on Schedule Now, and the replication will start within about a minute. As my virtual machine is only 2 gigabytes, the replication process is pretty quick, taking only about 40 seconds. I'm also going to replicate the virtual machine to node 3, and the process is again exactly the same. And finally, it's time to set up high availability. This will ensure that this virtual machine is running on one server at all times. If the cluster detects that a node has shut down or is otherwise unavailable, the virtual machine will be migrated to another node and automatically booted up. The data in that virtual machine will only be current to the last replication point, unless you're running some kind of a shared storage system, so keep that in mind. And by the way, shared storage is also coming up in a future video. To set up high availability, go to the data center, click on HA, or the high availability menu, and under resources, click on add. Then select the virtual machine you'd like to monitor, in my case, VM number 200, which is Pi-hole. We're going to leave everything at the defaults and then click on Add. In that menu, you should see that VM 200 is now being monitored, and you can see which node it is currently being run on. But how do we test it out? Well, to simulate a network failure, I'm going to unplug node number one from the network. And if everything is working correctly, the virtual machine should automatically start up on another node. So if I unplug the network cable right now, and then we fast forward through the screen capture, you can see the whole process only took about two minutes. Now, I'm sure that could be brought down for truly critical services, but for a home lab exercise, I'm pretty happy with those results, especially with fairly slow CPUs and mechanical hard drives over gigabit networking. And that's pretty much it. Your Proxmox cluster is now up and running with high availability for your virtual machines. And overall, I'm pretty happy with how this process went. Now, it did take a little bit of research because the documentation for Proxmox wasn't perfect on this subject. Uh, it took a little bit of fine tuning, especially in regards to the ZFS pool sharing. But overall, I'm really happy with the results here. I'm going to be doing quite a bit of home lab stuff here over the next couple of weeks. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you haven't done so already, and drop me a like on your way down there. If you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon or Floatplane. Links are down in the video description. As a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, as well as other premium content coming soon. If you have any questions about today's video, please leave them down in the comment section below. I do try my best to get back to everyone. And if you'd like to pick up any of the hardware from my home lab, I will have affiliate links for everything down in the video description. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Sorry, I got a little bit of a jump start on the beer today while I was finishing up the script. Uh, this is a collaboration between Torn Label Brewing and Thou Mayest Coffee Roasters. It is their mansion brew, Imperial Wheat Stout with Coffee Added, 8.8%. This is significantly different than a number of other coffee stouts that I've had. Um, the coffee really isn't like a, a roast coffee. 
tastes a lot more like a latte. It's kind of like the difference between getting dark chocolate and milk chocolate in a coffee. It can wildly change the taste of it. And uh, yeah, this is way more similar to like a, a milk chocolate. It's a little bit smoother. The roastiness isn't nearly as pronounced because the coffee isn't playing off the dark chocolate notes. Um, it's pretty good. Very, very smooth for eight and a half percent. This is a very smooth beer. Um, it's a little bit strange to me because while it is missing a lot of the bitterness that you typically get in an Imperial Stout, things like, you know, the, the dark chocolate and the roasted coffee, it's also not too sweet either. Um, it's still a very, very well-balanced beer and I'm getting all the right flavors. They're just different flavors than I'm used to. Honestly, this is just a pretty decent stout. I've been really happy with this one. Um, it's not nearly as boozy flavored as you normally get for Imperial Stouts. Um, it's not quite as roasty or quite as dark. Um, it's not quite as thick, but it is very smooth. Um, if you're interested in getting into dark beer, this might be a pretty good starter for you.